Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about yet another very important concept in machine learning and data science that's known as cross-validation. But before we talk about cross-validation, let's understand why do we need validation. So when we create machine learning models, essentially the objective is to learn from the historical data and perform well on the future data. That's why we make predictions. Therefore, a good model should be able to generalize well on an unseen data. Validation allows us to estimate how well a model is likely to perform on new or unseen data on which the model has not been trained or data that the model has not yet seen. Now, how do we achieve such data? So what happens is when we're given a data, we essentially divide it into parts. Let's take a scenario. Let's say we're talking about the renewal of the internet services. So each row represents a subscriber and the column of interest or the target column for us is the renewal status. Based on two features, first is the average daily consumption in megabytes. And the second is whether during a particular month there was an interruption in the services. If the response is yes, it means the subscriber has renewed the contract. If it's no, it's likely that the subscriber has canceled the contract or switched to some other provider. So we don't have future data here. What we have right now with us is the historical data. This column represents the actual renewal status based on the historical data. How do we bring the future data? We don't have to wait for future data to come. Instead, we'll park some of this data as future data. So let's say we select some records, two or three records. In this case, we have chosen randomly three records. We select these three records as our test data. So now the overall data would be divided into two parts. First is the random selection that we've made. And second is whatever is left. So what we left with is not the entire data now is a sample of the overall data because we have already segregated some records as test. Now, this larger portion of the data is something that's used for training the model. But there is a problem. How do we know that the choice that we have made for the test data is apt? Because it was a random choice. So we know that our model learns on the trained data. And the trained data is such because some other records have been parked as test. What if these records were not the same? We could have picked some different indices here. And as a result, the trained data would change. So when the trained data changes, the output output performance would also change. Let me show it to you in a hands-on way. So we've come to Google Collaboratory and let's import the necessary libraries. Since it was a pretty small data, just for demonstration purposes, we can create that data frame ourselves. So we are creating a data frame using a dictionary where we are creating these three columns. And these are the values that we've shown you on the slides. When we put this dictionary inside a pd.data frame, that will generate a proper data frame with the 10 rows that we had. Zero to nine, that's 10 rows. And these are the features. This is the target column. For this exercise, we'll not go too deep into the nitty gritties of data pre-processing and model preparation and how a model functions, we'll just perform certain basic steps necessary. So one basic step that's mandatory is that when you give input to a model, all the features should be numerical. So this particular column, interruption, if you see right now is an object type column or a categorical column. We will convert it to a numerical column by encoding it properly. So interruption column is being overwritten wherein we are replacing the yeses with a one and nos with a zero. All these labels will be encoded. And then we are separating X and Y. This is how the input is given to most of the scikit-learn models. So that's what we are doing. We're separating the consumption and interruption, which are explanatory features, and the target column, which is the renewal status. Let's do this. And once we have done this, we choose to do an 80-20. We could have also done a 70-30 in this case, but let's just say we do 80-20. What are we doing? We're calling the train test lit method from the scikit-learn model selection module, and we are dividing the data into train and test set. Test set is 20% of the overall data. Let's say we do it. Next step will be to instantiate a model. Let's say we choose a logistic regression model and we fit the model to the train data. Model is always fit on the train data. So that's what we are doing here. So now the model is fit. And once the model is fit, we can generate predictions. We can generate predictions for train and we can generate predictions for test. Let's say we generate predictions for the test data directly here. So we do model.predict and generate predictions. Now comparing the actual ground truth labels, which were a part of the Y test as we found through a split here, and the predictions that we've just generated, we are going to populate the accuracy score. We are not going too deep into various model performance measures right now, the focus is only on cross-validation. So let's say we got the accuracy score. Now the accuracy is one, which is 100%. That's the best we could have asked for. Let's say these steps that you see here, these four or five steps that we have performed, we put them together in one cell. Why we are doing this is because we need to show you something that will be relevant. So we're putting all these steps in one cell and running this code again. The accuracy is 0.5. What has changed? Just now when we ran this code using four or five different cells, we got the accuracy is one. And now we got the accuracy is 0.5. This is happening because every time we do a train test split, it's randomly selecting some records as test and the remaining is left as train. Now, if the random choice of test is not consistent, the test data is changing and even the train data is changing because what's left after extracting the test data from the overall data is called train. So when the test records are changing, the train records are also changing. When the records are changing, the model itself is going to change because you fit the model on certain records. So the model slightly changes. And even the data 
on which we are validating the model itself is not static because it's changing based on a random choice. Let me show you the train and test indices for this current accuracy of 0.5. So we have chosen seventh and eighth record. These are indices. We had indices from zero to nine. So we have chosen seventh and eighth record as test randomly. If I refresh this code, observe the outcome. Your accuracy has gone to zero. So we initially had the accuracy of one, then it came to 0.5 and now it's zero. In the last iteration, the test records were seventh and eighth indices. What would these be now? These are now seventh and fifth indices. So the values are changing. I'll refresh it one more time. Let's run it one more time. So now your accuracy has once again become one and you can see the indices are six and eight. So you keep on refreshing it, you'll see some changes here and there. So now the problem is if this is how it keeps on changing, how do we come up with a reliable model? Because just now our accuracy started with a one, then it became a 0.5, then it became zero. And once again, we are back to one. How do we ever come up with a model that's stable and reliable? Well, one such thing can be achieved by ensuring that every time that you split the data into train and test, these records are identical. And that can be achieved by mentioning a random state. So this is the exact same code we've discussed a couple of times, but the only thing we are adding here is a random state. This could be any number that we pass. This would ensure that our train and test bit every time is consistent. Let me run this. So the accuracy is 0.5 and let's look at the train and test indices. The train and test indices are seven and eight. Let me change these to seven and eight and show you the records also. Which records are these? So these are the two records on which we have performed the test or validation here. If I refresh this code, the outcome would not change. Once again, in Indices are seven and eight only. However, if I change this input, for example, if I change this 11 to one, two, three, which means the random state has been changed. Now the indices would also change. The selection would also change. And the selection change means the records have been changed. So we got index four and zero, and these are different records, not seven and eight anymore. And your accuracy is one. So the point is, how do we know if this is the right random state? This is a very simple example. We only have 10 records. We can look at the data. We can monitor the indices. But imagine if a data is large, how are you going to ever find the right random state? Random state solves one problem for us. It ensures consistency in terms of whatever we were getting as an out. At least that problem is not there. But this still is a big question mark. How do we find out the right random state? Should we be optimizing our model on the random state? The answer is no. Then what's the solution? The solution comes to us in the form of k-fold cross-validation. Let's discuss that. So what is a k-fold cross-validation? Here's our data. Let's say it has 10 records. And if we choose the value of K as five, which means we are going to divide our data into five folds or five parts. So how do we find out how many records are going to be there in each fold? It's the number of overall records divided by the number of folds. So we have 10 records. And if we divide it into five folds, then you can imagine each fold will have two records like this. We are going to fit the model multiple times over multiple iterations with varying test inputs. Let's say this is our fold one. It'll behave as the test data once and the remaining data here that we have all these records will behave as train. Similarly, this is the second fold. Now this will behave as test and the remaining data will behave as train. Likewise, this is the third fold. This becomes test and the remaining data behaves as train. Likewise, the fourth and the fifth. So if you see in this process, every record got an opportunity to play both the roles. These records earlier must have played train role for some other iteration, but now they're playing the role of the test data. What we're doing is we are increasing the generalizability of the model by not doing an experiment just once, but repeating it multiple times, multiple folds. So here are the five folds that we have. And the advantage is rather than just once considering a random here, we got it done multiple times. In fact, there is a way in the code that we can even shuffle these records and then apply the folds. So if you think that the folds are being derived linearly, zero, one, two, three, we can actually shuffle the data once and then apply these folds. So K fold is definitely going to be more robust. So it's like if I toss a coin and I claim that every time I toss a coin, I get heads and I show it to you once. What are you going to say? You're going to say, if you can get heads every time, then show it to me a couple of times more. That's when you'll begin to trust if I'm able to get heads every time that I toss it. Similarly here, if you get any result out of a model, you're not just sticking to it. You're repeating that multiple times over different folds. And what you get as the end result will be more reliable because it's not just one experiment. It's an outcome of multiple experiments. Let's see how this actually works using the hands-on. So in order to do k-fold, we'll have to call the k-fold class from sklearn model selection. And we also have to call the cross-validation score class, which will be used for generating the cross-validation scores based on these k-folds. Why are we calling it cross-validation? Because we are taking this one data and dividing it into multiple folds. And we are doing a cross-validation because each record is getting to play the role of train and test. It's a cross-validation that way. We are using the k-fold class where we're mentioning the number of splits. Let's say we decide to create five folds. Generally, the value 
value of K could be three, five, or 10. We've not taken 10 folds because we just had 10 records. 10 fold would typically make sense for a relatively larger data set. And what we're doing is that we are trying to apply the split on the X or the overall input. We are no longer doing a train test split on the independent features. We are directly applying the split on the independent features and we are printing the train and test indices in a proper way. So you'll get to see how the folds are being selected. See, this is how it is. The first two records got selected as test and the remaining data became. Then if you remember fold two, those records, two and three, and the remaining data is train. Then four and five selected as test, remaining data is train. Six and seven is test, remaining data. This is exactly how we showed it. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, in order to apply this on the data and see the outcome, let's consider the X and Y as we had split originally and the logistic regression model. In fact, we could have called this from earlier reference as well. But just to refresh, this is how we had segregated X and Y, and this is how we had called the model. And this is the K fold and split thing that we have written here as well. We're just calling it as the input for the cross validation. Now, this function called cross validation score would take the input as the model, take the overall X and Y, the entire data, and would take the input specific to the kind of cross validation we want to apply. And we can also pass a scoring parameter. In our case, we are taking it as accuracy, but it can vary. You can choose recall score or precision score, or for a regression problem, we can even change it to an R square value. We can refer to the function documentation for more details. But here, let's print the cross validation scores and check the average cross validation score. So remember, because we are iterating over the data multiple times, to be precise, five times, it's going to generate five cross validations. Five accuracy values will be generated and we would stick to taking an average of those five accuracies as the final model performance measure. So you can see the average of these five outcomes is 0.7. In our case, the data is just very limited. That's why the accuracy varies too much. Otherwise, you'd find the values will be nearly in a range and we can easily calculate their average in a reliable way. So the mean accuracy is 0.7. This is somewhat more reliable because this is based on multiple iterations. Now, there's one more aspect that we still need to look at. If you look at the target column, it has a certain proportion of yes and no, five and five. This may be different or skewed. This may not necessarily be equal all the time. And I want to display two specific folds that we created using K fold. Let's refer to a specific fold that fold two. In this particular fold, if you see, you had just one kind of outcome, which is a yes. And likewise, if we refer to fold five, it again has just one kind of outcome, which is a no. So the problem here is that you were supposed to be predicting yes and no, but we are only checking your understanding on no's. Likewise, for fold two, we are only checking models understanding for predicting yes. It's like for your exams, you prepare for two topics that are in scope, but all the questions come from just one topic. Is there a problem? The answer is yes, because we've not really been able to check your understanding on the other topic. So this is actually a flaw. How do we address this? So this is addressed using something that's known as the stratified K-fold cross-validation. How does it work? It looks at the overall data, but just doesn't do splits in that sequence. It first focuses on the target column and says, okay, so we have a target column which has some kind of a class. It may not be perfectly balanced, but whatever that ratio is, it could be 70, 30, 60, 40, 80, 20. It'll try to maintain that ratio even in the folds. So first, this data would be segregated into the two classes for the target column. For example, we have these five choices as no and the remaining five choices as yes. It'll first segregate the data based on the target column. So we filtered the overall data by yes and no. And now it will create folds like these. So the first fold will contain a record which had an outcome of yes and a record which had an outcome of no. Because our overall data was 50-50, it's maintaining that ratio. If the overall data would have been 70-30, it would have maintained that 70-30 ratio for each fold. At least it is going to try its best to maintain that ratio. Similarly, the second fold is created like this, third fold is created like this, fourth fold is created like this, and fifth fold is created like this. So we have done a stratification with respect to the target column. Let me show you how this works in code. So the code is very similar for stratified k-fold. It's just that from the same library, same module, we have to call stratified k-fold instead of k-fold. And in terms of inputs, it's pretty much the same. We have to mention the number of folds and we can even print the indices. Now notice when we did k-fold, we only had to give the input x because k-fold was being done on the overall independent set. But when we do stratified k-fold, we also have to give y as the input here because it's going to do stratification on the target column or the y variable. And let's see how it does. So this is how the indices have now been chosen. It's not perfectly linear.
senior. It's not zero, one, two, three, four, five, the way we had for K-Fold. Instead, it's it's finding out the pairs based on the stratification. This is the kind of code output. And here were the folds that we had. Index zero and one, that's one fold. Index two and four, that's another fold. Index three and seven, that's another fold. Index five and eight, that's another fold. Index six and nine, that's the final fifth fold. Now, nearly the same code, we have separated X and Y, and we are going to fit the same logistic regression model. But this time, for cross-validation, we'll be using stratified K-Fold. Once again, we'll be using the class called cross-val score, where we'll be passing the model, the overall X and Y, and this time the stratified K-Fold with the scoring on accuracy. When we run this, we get an outcome. Again, the mean accuracy is 0.7. You might be wondering, it's giving us the same mean accuracy. So these are not the techniques which are necessarily used to improve the model performance. These are the techniques which are used to make the model's performance more consistent and generalizable. Stratified K-fold will be meaningful whenever you have a target column, which is a class. It is not going to be useful for a target column, which is a value. So you may selectively use it and it gets more and more useful if your target has more imbalance. Treating the target imbalance is a separate topic which we'll be covering in a subsequent video. But with the kind of imbalance that we have to begin with, we should not induce any bias. That we end up presenting that one outcome, which is the best outcome. That'll be a biased outcome. We should rather give an equal opportunity for each record to be selected by using these different folds. And a stratification only ensures that we also look at the target column and its proportions. Hope this helps you understand the concept of cross-validation. You'll see more of this in the detailed hands-on case studies when we'll be applying many of these concepts together. Thank you.